ARA webinars are brought to us by Frauscher, who sponsor the ARA webinar series. And my name is Natalie Curry, and I'm the General Manager of Supply Chains at the ARA. And I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet. For me, based in Canberra, it's the Ngunnawal people, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. With $155 billion of rail investment planned over the next 15 years, the need to build a skilled and capable workforce is absolutely a priority. ARA published a report back in 2018 called Skills Capability Study, Skills Crisis, a Call to Action. And the rail industry in Australia and New Zealand was already experiencing skill shortages as investment grew in new rail infrastructure and rolling stock and operations expanded, with the new work number of workers in rail not keeping up with the growing demand. Just as importantly, from a future skills perspective, the industry was also suffering a chronic shortage of trainers and assessors. Since then, we've been working with government and industry to support the establishment of the National Rail Action Plan, which has a skills work stream that ARA CEO Caroline Wilkie co-chairs. The ARA also engaged Claire Parry, who has extensive experience in both rail and education industries, to provide us with a fresh view of the challenges now and those facing us as we move forward to establish a national rail skills hub. Claire has written an extensive report, which will be available to everyone attending today, as well as ARA members and other interested parties. The process underpinning the development of the report focused on identifying practical activities that the ARA with industry and government could lead. I'd now like to introduce Fiona Love, the ARA General Manager for Workforce Development. Fiona has over 20 years experience in rail industry and has led many training and development functions, both in state rail, rail corp and transport for New South Wales. Fiona will give a brief introduction to the strategies explored in the report. Welcome Fiona. Thanks, Nat. Um, it's great having you all with us today. Um, as Natalie pointed out, we've been in a situation of skills crisis for many years now. Um, and with the expanding investment that's happening in rail uh, over the next currently and over the next few years, it's never been a more important time than now to deliver some practical solutions to the many challenges that are inherent in the skills crisis. Claire's provided us with the strategies that are designed to alleviate the growing shortage of skills facing the industry through a coordinated approach for the future attraction, recruitment, skills development and retention of the workforce. So the key areas of focus that we're going to discuss today include the development of a nationally coordinated approach to rail skills and training strategies, anticipation and determination of rail skill demands, promotion and development of rail career pathways and entry, port, entry points into the industry. And finally, the provision of ongoing skills development to ensure there's an effective supply chain to deliver skilled people through an accredited network of providers. All the strategies that Claire has identified align to the skills and labour objectives within the National Rail Action Plan and recommendations from the National Transport Commission Skills and Labour Committee. So it's a very rich discussion ahead for us all. Thanks, Nat. Thank you so much, Fiona. I'd now like to welcome Claire Parry to provide a summary of her insights from the research findings. Claire is the Managing Director of Infrastructure Skills Advisory and is an international recognised expert in social procurement, workforce development and industry participation. She leads planning and delivery for organisations that are responsible for commissioning, procuring or delivering jobs, skills development, diversity and inclusion and industry outcomes. Thanks so much, Claire. Over to you. Thanks, Nat. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today and I hope you'll find some of the outputs from the session interesting and join in um, with some great questions and for us for the panel. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the methodology behind the, the study. So what did we do and how do we come, come up with the outcomes? We were obviously building on that great report back in 2018 um, and looking really at how we could provide some recommendations based on the research and, that, and some industry feedback from the UK, other parts of the globe and obviously Australia as well. We would offer some strategies and solutions which will increase that rail capacity and capability into the future. So that research was made up of a number of different, I guess, work streams. Some of that was desktop research, looking at data, um, looking at education outcomes, looking at availability of education programs, looking at what we could find out about the rail workforce itself, 
um, talking to industry uh, skilled service organisations and rail specialists. So we did a lot of interviews. We took a lot of one-to-one um, -one interviews and interviews with teams from within different organisations um, within the industry. So Metro Train Trains Victoria, V-Line, ARTC, PTA in Western Australia, Sydney Trains, WSP, Siemens, um, Australian Industry Standards and members of the Industry Reference Committee and then other organisations across the world, particularly in the UK because of the relationship that already exists between ARA and the UK National Skills Academy for Rail, which is a model that um, I think we've, we've looked at quite closely. So talking to them and also talking to their national college um, for uh, advanced transport infrastructure, which is previously known as the HS2 college and major projects such as Crossrail in the UK. So that was a kind of background, it was a flavour of what we were doing. Um, and as Fiona said, there was a number of key themes that are up there on the screen that you're looking at there. Uh, and obviously the first thing was to really, you know, establish what, what was the, the baseline, where are we now? Um, and some of the things I'm going to talk about won't be a surprise. They're things that you already know and you'll recognise from what's going on for you within industry every day. So at the moment um, in Australia, there isn't actually any nationally coordinated approach to rail skills and training, which is obviously why we've now got the National Rail Action Plan. And there isn't a shared national picture around current and future skill needs and career pathways. We've got a lot of infrastructure project delivery going on. Everybody's really aware of that massive infrastructure pipeline and how that's really um, the majority of that is actually within the rail and sorry rail and road networks. Um, and obviously, with that going on and the co combination of that with the closure of international borders, so the the inability to bring people in from overseas, and then that global, you know, from the the pandemic. Um, and the already critical skills shortages in the industry means that we're actually creating an even greater skills shortage um, for the industry going forward. And that investment in um, rail delivery and operations going forward is only going to um, further impact the industry's ability to deliver those projects. In terms of what we would call strategic workforce planning, there is no system of a, there is no system and there's no approach at the moment to accurately, accurately forecast skills rail demand against availability. So we don't really know what we need and we don't know what we've got and we don't know how long it's going to last. We know anecdotally that we've got an aging workforce and we know we don't have a very diverse workforce, but we aren't actually able to do that matching to inform the way that we strategically plan our workforce for the future. There's also no centralised record across rail skills competencies other than what we've got within RIW to map individual or industry right competencies and qualifications to again support that, that planning and succession planning, career development for individuals. Um, if we want to attract young people into the industry, well, there's a lack of information out there around rail careers. And I think one of the most um, I, I guess the, one of the greatest things that we kind of recognised through this was there are actually no rail related undergraduate courses across Australia, which means there's no rail specific academic new entrant pathways at the moment in Australia, which is obviously a major deterrent to future talent entering the industry um, and where we're in competition for that talent, talent with other industries, that's not going to help us secure the people that we need for the future. Um, the rail industry, as we know, those of us that are in it and love it, know that it's very, um, it's highly technological and it's full of career opportunities and the, the, the kind of the, the broad career opportunity exists. Um, but the image of the rail industry doesn't reflect that. So we're not making it attractive. Um, it's not sexy and we're going to have to change that if we're going to attract a younger and more diverse workforce and a workforce that can respond to those technologies which are going to need a different type of skill and a higher level of skill going forward. So we get into more competition in the market to draw that talent to us. So just on that point, in terms of our current workforce and our future workforce, that digitalization and other new technologies are driving demand for new jobs or expanded skills. So skill levels are rising and there's a different composition of skills. So we need to look at who we've got, what their skills are, and how those are going to have to change or be enhanced in the future. For rail training itself, often that's been delivered in-house and that has meant there's little investment 
in vocational education providers to deliver um, and develop rail training. We know what the situation is within HE as well. So that's reflected in the quality and availability of public training and probably in the confidence in public training by the industry as well. Um, there's also a lack of resources, whether that be trainers and assessors or whether it be, you know, rail kit and equipment to enable um, people to be trained um, to something that is industry standard and what industry would expect um, going forward. So in terms of some of our recommendations, um, what we've, um, sorry, just going back to some of the, the, the key points I missed on there, um, we need to really look at developing a nationally coordinated approach to rail skills and training strategies, being cognizant, obviously, of the fact that there are domain um, and product changes. Um, we've got to anticipate skills demand better, and we've got to be able to promote and develop career pathways and ongoing skills development for the future through a network of providers that um, industry has confidence in. So some of the key recommendations that we've looked at really, I guess, um, are, will be determined, their success will be determined on how great the collaboration and partnership is between the rail industry, between government and the education sector. It really is that triangulation which is going to make this a success because all of those parties need to be involved and integrated to ensure we get the right outcomes in terms of rail skills for the future. So we, we totally support um, the establishment of the National Rail Skills Hub as a virtual hub to lead and coordinate an approach between those parties that will promote those careers and grow workforce capacity. Um, we think that's got to be um, brought to life through um, a rail implementation plan. So what does that actually look like over the next few years? What are the priorities in terms of skills development and delivery going forward? We think there should be the establishment of a um, accredited national network of art rail RTOs. So we know that ASQA um, and Victorian and WA equivalents are responsible for the quality assurance of education providers, but we believe that needs to have industry assurance wrapped around it as well to give confidence to the industry and ensure that what's being delivered is current and, and relevant. Uh, much in the same way, we think there needs to be a register of approved trainers and assessors, and that those should be assured through industry and education standards. Um, we think there needs to be the development of, of a hub and spoke rail training network. So the National Rail Skills Hub is virtual. If we can establish those uh, that RTO network, we'll eventually effectively get a hub and spoke network that might include centres of excellence in different um, in, in different states and territories. Um, it might be um, smaller centres that are part of an existing TAFE that provide entry pathways. I think it's, there's no one single approach to that. And we also think there's an um, a port, important role for the hub to play in terms of skills and innovation centre. So to be able to undertake research and publish reports, guidance material for the industry for now and into the future in terms of what skills will be required um, and what skills development um, as a result will need to be delivered to support the industry into the future. In terms of um, understanding what's going to be needed and, um, and plan for workforce in the future, uh, we've looked very closely at a model that exists in the UK called the Skills Intelligence Model. That's owned by the National Skills Academy for Rail. Um, just to give a bit of background on them, they are um, an organisation that is um, originally funded through government but led by industry. Um, they are a virtual organisation and they have a network of accredited RTOs, trainers and assessors. Um, and they own um, a tool which is um, able to undertake demand and supply side modelling. And that would support obviously workforce planning, gap analysis, in infrastructure investment planning and so on going forward. Um, to support that, some rail, uh, rail skills competency management system, which will really, which is really an extension of um, the Rail Industry Worker Programme, which will provide a secure online record of individuals' competencies. We think in terms of attraction, recruitment and retention of our workforce, there's a lot to do there. We're keen to develop a National Rail Careers Work, um, sorry, a National Rail Careers Framework, 
which would build on some existing national skills matrices to really describe the types of careers and opportunities that um, are available in the industry. There's obviously a need to develop a far greater range of vocational and academic entry pathways for new entrants to the industry and to encourage others that might consider transferring from other industries at either entry, um, semi-skilled and skilled worker levels. We think that rail careers and job vacancies should be promoted through a centralised careers website or careers and jobs website and associated social media and communication channels. Um, and there's a great deal of work that could be done through promoting future talent um, in schools, um, different programmes, school partnerships, triad trade, STEM, work placement, teacher, lecture professional development programmes. Um, and I think core to this as well is we probably know uh, what the workforce, the makeup, the demographic makeup of the workforce is at the moment. There's a lot to be done around equality, diversity and inclusion and really encouraging diversity groups to consider careers in the industry and supporting them to, uh, to be attracted, but also to be retained in the industry as well. So to make the, 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 the industry more inclu inclusive and welcoming to different diversity groups. In terms of upskilling the workforce that we have at the moment, um, we think there's a need to develop essentially a, a national rail skills hub rail skills program portfolio, which will provide a range of different entry programs, micro credentials and short courses, and obviously longer full qualifications as well, but would also provide for domain and product differences. So that might include pre-employment and pre-apprenticeship programs and training, rail familiarization and upskilling for those transferring from other industries and skills development for the existing workforce. And then to back that up, there'd be um, essentially accredited or standardised training materials and resources which will be available to those um, members of the, uh, if you like, the, the RTO rail accredited network. Um, so we knew that we were getting a standardised approach to training and what's been delivered. We also believe that there needs to be the establishment of a higher education working group. There's a lot to be done in the university sector to support um, the development and, or extension of existing programs and provide HE pathways through kind of mic and micro credentials. It could be signaling mechatronics infrastructure and rail content into existing programs, for example, civil and mechanical engineering and rail specific professional development opportunities. So I think that's kind of a, a very quick run through of the key recommendations that we made. There's obviously a lot to be done to actually implement and deliver that. Um, but that's that's essentially um, the recommendations that were made to the report. That's Thank really you. helpful summary. Thanks, Claire. Lots of work to do, not a shortage of things, things to get started on. Look, I'm going to invite all the panellists to come on. But before I do, um, there was just a question that comes through that is probably specific for you, Claire, in terms of what you've just explained. And it says, can you expand on the integration of rail resource management in the nationally coordinated approach to rail skills and training. Is that something that you picked up in your research? Sorry, could you just say that again for me, Nat? Sorry. Can you expand on the integration of rail resource management in the nationally coordinated approach to rail skills and training? Okay, so is is that referring to essentially that, that piece around understanding the the range of resources that are available at the moment is that what we're we're talking about yeah I it's, a, it's a guess because i don't have any more information if if christina wants to join <laughs> to jump in but fiona's fiona's yeah, going to hand I, up, I, was uh, just gonna say, I think in aviation we'd call it crm crew resource management but in rail we call it rail resource management but it is about it's a human you know it's the human factors aspect of um of training design and how how we go about um, behaving and, and thinking. Uh, it certainly relates to, I think, improving people's risk intelligence and, and other aspects of, around their decision making in particular, but also yeah. their communication and their teamwork. It's, it's those aspects. That was not a particular focus, I think, would be fair to say, Claire, no. of, um, no, of the report, it wasn't. but it, it's and it would be lovely to think we were far more mature in this space because it actually turns the dial on safety. Anyway, I'll, I'll no, that's, that's and I think it's it, 
it's probably the next stage as well because what we've essentially said is look there's a there's a whole host of skills development and different types of development work that's got to be done and really thinking to the to the future in terms of the different types of skills and behaviors and attributes people have got to have in those roles so in terms of that skills development portfolio absolutely that's where that work's got to be done yeah that's great, Claire. Um, so many uh, topics that you mentioned that I really want to tease out in our panel discussion. So let's uh, now invite our esteemed panellists to join us on screen. Um, today's panel includes Narelle Rogers, the Australian and New Zealand Rail Systems Lead at Jacobs. Narelle has spent over a decade in rail-related learning environments, previously the Infrastructure Competency Manager at Beeline and the National Rail Competency and Training Manager at John Holland and the chair of the Rail um, Industry Worker Governance Committee. And Narelle is also the chair of ARA's Mentoring Community of Practice. Welcome, Narelle. Joining Narelle, we've got Trevin Martinez, CEO and founder and the driving force behind Martinez, Australia and New Zealand's leading rail infrastructure contractor. Trevin's passion for the rail industry fueled his determination to establish a successful Australian-owned Tier 1 contractor with more than 1,000 employees. And Trevin's visionary leadership has guided the business through exponential growth. And Trevin is really passionate about building a strong and diverse workforce, which is provided with endless opportunities to grow and advance. I love your motto, Trevin. It says, if our people grow, we grow. And that just shows your commitment um, to grow industry leaders and, um, and deliver a world-class rail infrastructure. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Sandra McKay, um, Executive Leader, Facilitated Reform at the National Transport Commission, who is responsible for the Facilitated Reform Portfolio at the NTC, which includes the Safety Program Partnerships, the National Rail Action Plan, and the Communications and Engagement Function. From overarching transport plans, a white paper on climate change, road safety strategies, and stakeholder engagement plans, Sandra really enjoys building enduring relationships through support, public supporting public policy change for the better. And Fiona Love's going to join us back on screen um, on our panel. So just a reminder, you can submit questions in the chat box. I see a few of you are doing that already. That's wonderful. It's at the right hand side of your screen. Please post them at any time, and we'll try and get them. Uh, get through them throughout our um, our next time of discussion. So let's kick off. Treven, I'll, uh, I'll throw to you first. I know how passionate you are about making sure Martinez is a learning organisation and you invest in education for your people. So do you think there is a growing acknowledgement by governments of the importance of building national learning solutions that support companies like yours, particularly when you've got staff mobility needs? Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Thanks for that question, Nat. Um, firstly, yeah, the industry needs um, to develop the the skills and a national approach and making sure there is a mobile workforce. Um, it's a obviously it's been a challenge over the last two years with COVID, but as the borders start to reopen, um, there's a real opportunity if we do it right. We can expand the availability of skills that are currently in the, in the industry. I think um, no better than the initiative of the ARA is undertaking with the national skills matrix and um, and the, the skills workforce, because with that, the, the key disciplines that are required to deliver our project, to, to deliver the outcomes for the industry um, will be will be expanded. It means that um, our expertise, our, our local expertise can work across all the rail industries. Um, Australia is very unique that uh, all the, the government asset owners, maintainers, Rail delivery authorities, along with the, the private resource railways, um, have traditionally worked in um, in, in silos. But uh, there is an opportunity to to break those silos down, break those barriers, and make sure that there's a national approach. Yeah, and a, and a question's come in, Trev, and it says something that's prevented collaboration between Australian states over the years of the, the plethora of competency frameworks, which you sort of touched on. Um, and uh, are there any proposals or recommendations to rationalise uh, the competency frameworks? And I'm I'm really pleased to say yes, work has kicked off in this area um, in terms of building national matrices to identify what can be harmonised across um, jurisdictions. Um, Narelle, can I just throw to you on that question? I know you've got a lot of experience in this space. Do you want to add around um, a bit of more of a detail around that work and how that would benefit industry? Absolutely, Nat. Thank you. Um, when I look back 
I'm reminded of just how far we've come um, in rationalising skill, skills for rail across the country, but we've got a long way to go as well. So if we're in an environment we're already experiencing resource scarcity, anything that inhibits the mobility of our staff works against us. So the work that the Governance Committee have done to rationalise national matrices helps organisations um, have transferable skills uh, across jurisdictions. Largely, the focus has been in the blue collar arena, which is wonderful, but more and more we're seeing uh, the need for that white collar transition as well, particularly on the back of the nature of procurement that we're seeing through government. So the more work that we can do to make it easier to get our talented people across jurisdictions, the better. Um, and I'm sure we'll speak more to this uh, later in our discussions, but also increasing our global mobility as well and making sure that we have uh, a framework that enables us to draw on resources uh, across the globe. Indeed. And that national approach is just critical. Um, Sandra, the agreement to have a national rail skills hub is, um, is really exciting for industry. Um, it points, I guess, to the real commitment by government to actually partner with industry to address the skills crisis. So what will be the initial focus for the National Rail Skills Hub, um, given its lifespan is projected um, to be three years? How do you see that work sort of transitioning to a new industry cluster in terms of skills development? Thanks, Nat. Well, I think it is an exciting time. Uh, many of you have been working on the challenges in rail skills for 10 and 20 years. And I think what's different now is that planets are aligning. You know, you've got um, all levels of government investing in rail projects. And it was industry who brought to the collection of uh, transport and infrastructure ministers across all states and the Commonwealth back in 2019, the scarcity concerns. And as a result of that, the National Rail Action Plan was born and it's a, a joint effort between industry and Sandra, I think we've just lost your volume just then. You just cut out. Do you want to just check um, your connection? Um, see if you can... No, that doesn't work. But we'll, we'll come back to you, Sandra, because I'm really keen to, to, to hear what we've got planned around. Try again. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Keep going. Oh, Thanks. Sorry about that. Yeah, so the, um, you know, so you've got all the right parties around the table working together, which is actually quite unusual. You know, normally governments might ask for industry's input, but you're actually around the same tables. And as you mentioned, Nat, you've got the the head of the ARA and Carolyn Wilkie and the head of the South Australian um, Infrastructure and Transport Department co-chairing um, a, a really senior group and then working groups underneath it. So you've got this collective effort. And so the first role, and it was their idea to come up with a National Rail Skills Hub, it's virtual, but its key task is to the point of Claire is, is to coordinate and to link up. We know there's heaps of effort going on individually from industry and individually by jurisdictions, but it was all not in a in a common connected world. So networking up that effort, sort of having a, a best practice, understanding where there's pockets of things that are working well, how do you lift them up, how do you share it, is the sort of number one um, goal. And I think some of the recommendations coming out of Claire's report for an accredited national network. Well, that's what we're sort of aspiring to grow, but it starts from understanding what already exists, what's working, what's been tried before and it has failed. Um, the need to wrap industry closely around it is, we know no, there's no one player who can do this on their own. And, and I think we can build that hub and spoke approach and have a whole lot more sharings going on. So the number one task of this virtual hub is to connect state-based rail academies and industry initiatives to sort of recognise each other's credentials, to tackle that portability issue and really lift the quality of training. And if we can do that by improving access and pathways and look at both what we need now, but what are the future rail skills that we can um, jump towards and knowing that there's, I think in the next five years alone, there's a massive investment. We're, it, peak um, period of um, major projects going through. So we haven't got time to sort of 
um, keep going over the problem. We've actually got to come up with some tangible solutions. And I think what you've got now from ministers is a collective understanding of that pressure and a sense that we can commonly address fees through collaboration. And, and just to touch on the three year element, this really goes to the fact that there's a lot of, you know, transport and rail is complex. So is the education and training space. There's big reforms happening at the national and state level in um, education and training. And the role of the hub is really to connect that up, connect rail so it's well positioned to national reform happening. And then we can start to improve our consistency, ensure rail skills are portable, start producing ready made digital course materials to lower the cost of entry for trainers. And I think as we harmonise rail, um, as we modernise rail, the rail skills um, work should, should be able to sort of lock in to that more streamlined approach. So I, I think we can do this. I like your positivity and, and these are important first steps that have commenced. So that's great. Look, there was a question that came in, Claire, around, you know, so many initiatives, but are they more sort of in the medium to long term, you know, initiatives to address the shortages? What are those immediate things that we need to do now to address the current crisis? And is it a case of, you know, better resource allocation? What what, what do we need to do? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, re it's a really good point because, I mean, obviously you can't create a new rail engineer overnight um, and you can't, you know, develop an apprentice in a week. So um, there's got to be a whole range, I think, of different entry pathways, different strategies and sort of short, medium and longer term. Um, so for me, I think I, the, there's something about looking at what we've got already and really understanding what competencies and skills exist because I think we've probably got quite a lot of untapped skills or people that are rich for development given the opportunity and some of that is really about not not that they can't do it well they can't do it because they don't have the time you know they haven't there isn't the training availability out there but we really need to make that space for people to be upskilled which then obviously provides great opportunities for people coming in the other end. I think there's a lot to be done around um, potential to transfer people from other industries. Um, you know, a lot of the skills in rail are actually common across, and I, I work not just across rail, but a lot of other industries. And I can tell you, everybody's looking to pinch people from other industries all the time. And a lot of the, the competencies and skills in rail are common in other industries as well. So I think there's something that could be done there, um, which is something that would be quicker. It's far easier to top someone up with 20% skills than to bring someone in with zero. Um, and another one that I, um, I'm really keen on at the moment, and I think needs a greater level of thought, is to look at skilled migrants from overseas. And I, I work with an organisation um, who's got an international um, angle talent beyond boundaries. They have 30,000 skilled people around the world looking to come into different countries. They are highly skilled people who are fluent in English, who are in the sector, who are engineers. You know, there's 5,000 engineers there. They have a program actually with the Australian government, um, specifically a new skilled migrant program to bring people like that into the country. I think we should be supporting that going forward um, and looking at you know, those creative ways of immediately addressing some of those skills crises. The other thing I would say, and I don't know whether it's within our power, but we are creating a lot of our own skill shortages. And, you know, we did it in the UK as well. We decided to de deliver everything at the same time. So there has to be greater cooperation between governments and even within states and territories to not do this um, and to plan its work, which actually provides and safeguards jobs into the future, because it gives people the potential, perhaps in the delivery phase of major projects, to move from project to project, you know, which actually then is a sustainable job. It means that, you know, you get skills development during that time. It's more effective, it's better quality and it's safer. So there's all sorts of benefits to planning infrastructure delivery um, in the longer term. It's not just about just looking at the skills we've got and trying to suddenly find more people. We need to be, we need to plan far better when we're going yeah. to develop these programs. I, I Can love I add to I know, Chris I'm going to go to comment, you. if I may? 
<laughs> I promise. I promise. But first, I just want to go to Treven. I'll pick up. I'll, I understand the migration thing, Narelle. I'm going to come to you next. But Treven, I know you've done this. Um, the first point that Claire made around new entrants coming in from other industries and pathways. Can you just expand on that before we move to the migration piece? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, very good points there, Claire, and uh, uh, three, three very good points. I will jump on that uh, first way about pathways uh, from other industries. It, it's a yeah, hundred percent right. It is the biggest opportunity to fill the skill shortage that we currently got, and it's filling with expertise in Australia by Australians for Australian projects. It's uh, it's the way that uh, we've successfully done it. There's a, a lot of industries in Australia that are They've been on the, the downturn. It's um, the automotive industry, um, the uh, unfortunately the airline industry currently with with COVID, and transferring those skills, the, the skilled expertise from those industries into the rail industry is is a way to to um, to fill this skill shortage, um, and it's it's a way to to get success straight away um, because they are already there. It's a an entry point that's not unskilled or coming straight out of an education system. They've already got uh, industry expertise. And um, as the way we're attracting them into the rail industry is giving a, we've got a program called Pathways to Growth. So it's it's identifying what pathways you have when you enter at different levels, different entry points from other industries is, is the one of the best entry points. And having, it's like almost to choose your own adventure of what career, what job where you can end up in the rail industry because there is so many diverse opportunities in the in the rail industry um, now and going into the, the future so I, I think that's a, an area we should focus on uh, a good example that we we've had uh, Pauline started as a, a casual laborer on um, on some of our projects just on weekend possessions and uh, she loved the industry that much that she left her office job to um, become a, a trainee plan operator and now she's a one of our resurfacing our tamper operators, which is a, a, you can't map that out. It's just needs to be built specifically for each person. It's you identify each individual um, what they what they want to aspire to and where they can go. It's uh, there. There's lots of opportunity. That's that's some great examples, Traven. Narelle, I'm really keen to hear from you because it, it's kind of a balance act, isn't it? How do we do homegrown talent, but also how do we engage with those internationally? Can you expand? Absolutely. Um, I think one thing we have to be mindful of is um, it's not going to be a one size fits all approach and it comes back to the nature of skills that we need. We are in a immediate skills crisis right now and it's directly and high, highly correlated to the shift of the nature of procurement. So we knew 10 years ago we we were experiencing skill shortages in rail, but that was related to um, some project delivery, but highly in operate and maintain areas. We are now looking at record investment in new innovation, uh, greenfield sites, um, uh, skills at the upfront beginning of the asset life cycle. So partnering with government, technical advising, um, optioneering, um, uh, concept design. So is this going to work? Is it is it is it feasible? Uh, business case development. So all of those skills are needed now and they're in critical short supply so if we don't optioneer it and design it we can't construct it if we don't construct it we can't operate and maintain it so there is a finite pool of those types of resources in our country and in new zealand because new zealand draws on, on, on australian and, and regional resources as well so some of the initiatives um, and there's a lag in the procurement model and I completely support this. The local content first as a one size fits all model actually works against us and inhibits the ability to deliver what's in the pipeline now. So a more intentional analyzed skills shortage would help us make the right decisions for the right scenarios. Um, but just back to Claire's point about um, we're part of a system. So yes, we have a, a skill shortage in rail, but we are part of a broader transport system and we're part of a global system. So when we see government procure transport infrastructure, so road and rail, 
Rail has unique skills, but we also have generic skills for delivery of projects that go across road and rail. So you've got design managers, project managers, commercial people that are critical to the success of the delivery of the project being stretched across concurrent multi-billion dollar projects. So where we would potentially call on our global resources, those same governments are using the same strategies to ignite post COVID economic recovery. So as a global community in infrastructure and in transport, we're in a crisis. So absolutely support your, your observations, Claire, about a whole of government approach, what is coming down the pipeline and how do we get more intentional about procuring, designing, constructing, operate, maintaining for the future. Mm. Really, really important points there. Fiona, look, it's not just a skill shortage in terms of workers. We also have sort of a, a training shortage as well, don't we? So I'm wondering if you could um, sort of pick up on that issue around shortage of trainers in terms of what approaches and strategies should we actually consider in terms of um, our, our approach to training currently? We do. Um, it is a chicken and egg race, really. I guess what I've, I'm talking about here is really in the vet sector, not so much the higher education sector. And I, I mean, in fact, with, in terms of higher education, because we don't have any rail undergraduate courses, of course, we don't actually have a lot of um, rail, you know, rail knowledge in the higher education sector at an engineering and technical level. Um, but in the vet space, it, this has been a growing problem probably over the last 25 years or so. Um, once, once the traditional sort of way of training happening within the big operating government um, government railways started to break down and privatisation and other strategies um, were employed by government, um, what we had was, a, a, and I think this happened in the UK as well, a lot of the trainers who were attached to those organisations moved into RTOs. They're still in those RTOs and they're now in their 60s and 70s and maybe some are in their 80s, who knows? They're ageing. Um, and there is, there hasn't been um, a strategic view about how to, you know, how do we replace those resources? Do we replace those resources? What's the context in which we're training now? And of course, now we're in a much more digital context um, with a lot more sort of technology that we can introduce into training. And I know from my last role in Transport for New South Wales, it's very challenging it's very challenging for me. It's very challenging for our aging trainers to to pivot to um, using digital technologies as a as a platform for their delivery of training um, in a rail corridor where they're sitting at a at a desk, if you like, um, engaging with subject matter experts and learners uh, from a distance and structuring the training through through a digital technology. But I think that's what we're going to have to do in the short and immediate term. We're not going to be suddenly inundated with trainers and assessors. So we are going to have to look to how do we innovate to be able to use trainers from one side of the country to the other who have these specialist knowledge um, and partner them. And this is where Moot talks to Claire's point around that, that partnership between government, industry and education. Education and industry particularly respecting each other and working together to deliver much more agile mobile solutions. Learners, younger learners um, are incredibly comfortable with you know, using digital technologies in their, in their training. And in fact, the assessment evidence that these digital technologies give us in terms of quality, which Sandra was talking about, it's, it's so much richer and more reliable and authentic um, than you, you know, your logbook from the 19th and 20th centuries. So I think, you know, the immediate, but longer term, we do need to think about, well, who are these trainers? What are the skills that they need? And what should the remuneration be? Because we all know a clear disincentive to becoming a trainer is that you're going to earn a lot less than you would earn uh, in, your, in your own role with your own sort of, you know, exercising your technical and, and competency capabilities in the workplace. You mm -hmm. know, you're going to get the, open. It, it's, a, it's a problem. So you get, you get those two spots, you get the older people who may be retiring and you might get younger people who perhaps have been, you know, on a rostered workforce for a long time and are starting a young family and want to be at home. But that's not sustainable <laughs> and, and it's proving not to be. And in fact, I know in Western Australia, we've had um, 
we've had courses, particularly in the signalling space, across all you know heavy haul and and freight and uh, infrastructure, not be able to be delivered. I mean, they've got halfway through a course, and a company might have um, poached is probably too strong a word, but offered a much more lucrative um, opportunity to the trainer, and they're out of there, and they're you know it's a single point of failure. So it's a it's a challenge that I hope very much that the um, the National Rail Skills Hub will will think through with industry about how we can how we can use our um, our academies, our centres of excellence, the the places we have now to innovate and uh, and do you know engage in a lot of proof of concept work that demonstrates mm -hmm. we can actually start to make a change. Thanks. So. And there's a, a couple of um, questions that have come in around training, which I really want to pick up. But you just made a point around compensation and the poaching. Treven, do you just want to jump in here? You made a, an incredible stat to me said um, the other day around how much uh, wages have increased and, and what is going on in terms of poaching. Do you want to just expand on, on what we're doing to ourselves? <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. It's as we've got the, the skills demand to, um, Companies for for the the deliver the construction phase. I'll talk to to that because that's the area of expertise. What we're seeing is um the yeah, salaries increased by by twenty percent in the the last year, which is which is I see I see as okay. It's um the issue is when contractors um win a project and then they poach from other contractors to deliver that project because they haven't invested in their own workforce and developed their own workforce from all the different pathways of entries that we talked about earlier and try to poach from other industries where they're offering double salaries, uh, double the, the the current salary. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm humbled and fortunate that, that even with those offerings that um, a lot of our teams still stay with uh, uh, with Martinez and uh, continue to deliver on. But uh, that's definitely not a sustainable industry if we do that mm. to each other. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Treven. So I just wanted to pick up, there's a lot of questions coming through, so we might have to move this along a bit quicker. But one was around a suggestion, um, the Metro Tunnel Project in Victoria has a cadet engineering program. So um, the students actually work, um, you know, they go to uni and then they're also on site. And, and they're saying that that's such a great um, example, but obviously that requires some funding and support. Um, Narelle, I might shoot to you first in terms of your experience in um, Victoria in terms of partnership models with universities. Can you share a bit more? One um, standout success story for me, not so much with the university, but a really um, wonderful example of collaboration where stakeholders have come together for a successful outcome is the Rail Signalling Cadet Program that Level Crossing Removal uh, Project coordinates. That's a three-year postgrad qualification and it's a beautiful example of where we've known that there's that there's a gap uh, it's a three-year program uh, with three rotations so that engineer gets the opportunity to say work in a design consultancy like, like Jacobs could go to a tier one constructor and then to an operator so at the end of that program you get a well-rounded engineer rail signaling engineer that understands again that last cycle of, of the asset so it's a it, I think it's in the in the fifth year with great success so um we'd love that's to see more of that, that. Yeah. yeah but that's only in rail signaling not we don't have it in you know systems engineering or we don't have it in overhead wiring um there's but a great pilot that we could lessons learn Absolutely. and where we could replicate. And I think that's what we really need to see more of and really profile um, those great examples. So there's a couple of questions that are coming through in terms of how do we marry up in terms of the education and training versus the needs um, of when you're on site and, and the thought around micro credentials. Fiona, can I flick to you first in terms of how do we find the balance of what you need to learn um, for the job? Yeah, well, I think um, I think you learn a lot on the job. So it is. It's always been about that sort of integration of on and off the job learning. We've traditionally had uh, rails had far too much emphasis off the job and theory based. Um, whereas, in fact, you know, competency requires you know knowledge, skills, values, attitudes, all those things in pretty equal weight. So. Uh, the majority of the learning and the application of the learning needs to happen, you know, in the context of a a, a, a role, a job. Sort of at what Narelle was talking about in terms of the success of that graduate program is that they're spending three years postgraduate. But I guess what I'd like to see is more integration of that undergraduate and 
industry experience. Um, and similarly, in the vet space, uh, a lot more integration. Because in a, in a way, I mean, I, I, I must say, I remember some years ago, people starting to talk about why are universities in all these major capital programs continuing to build more and more classrooms? Well, when they most students only go in for about, you know, 20% of their lectures, if that, they do them all online um, and do the research typically online through online libraries and so forth. And it's, we need to move much more in that, to that sort of model of learning, I think, in the rail space itself and leverage, as I said earlier, much more of those relationships with industry to, put, to be able to put learners into situations where they can accelerate their learning. And perhaps less, traditionally, we've had a very time-based approach to learning. So, you know, you might join as an infrastructure worker, do a couple of units, you know, your SARC and various things to get out on the job, and then you'll go to a depot and sort of follow people about and wait for the next opportunity to come and do another unit. Um, very often that's linked to a competency-based pay structure, so you get a bit more money. I know that a lot of people in um, one of the organisations I worked in had fell small trees because it was an easy unit to get, but it gave them some more pay, even though they weren't filling any small trees. Um, so yes, I think one of the things industry needs to do is think about, and through partnering with education, we'll better understand that if you can get people onto a learning curve where they're not sort of having their learning happening, then stopping, then happening, then stopping. So spend as much time revising as you do acquiring new learning. If you're actually on a learning pathway that's structured and building that learning, that you actually accelerate the learning massively, but you also get a much um, improved level of competence at the end of that learning. And then you start your experience journey. I mean, the other thing I think is this confusion around experience and learning. You, you know, learning will give you competence, but it doesn't, you know, experience you're going to acquire for the rest of your life. And if you can acquire that with a learning mindset, all the better. Um, but to expect we, the world is moving much too quickly for us to spend, what is it, 16 years to get to the top of a, a signaling uh, engineer assurance um, role. Thanks, Fiona. I'm keen, Claire, to sort of tie in around the Skills and Innovation Centre and how, um, I guess, the establishment of this sort of resource can really support industry. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, you could set up a um, National Rail Skills Hub tomorrow with a range of training courses, you know, that were current and suited what was going on now. And by next week, it would be out of date, such as the change in the movement forward in the rail industry, whether it's, you know, as Narelle's brought up, you know, from design, planning, you know, delivery, operations, maintenance, everything's moving and will continue to move at speed. And I think that kind of skills and innovation centre could not only be, I guess, a model for keeping track of making sure that we're always current, um, but also I see it as something that can really, um, I guess, influence and inform, um, it can help plan and evaluate what's going on for the industry. And it's that single place, which is, you know, uh, I guess represents the industry and can have those conversations that need to be had, can give, you know, to, can allow people to have informed conversations that are based in data. If we, if we get to a stage of having something like the um, the SIM model around, you know, workforce demand planning and so on. It then, you know, those kind of reports and research that come out of the back of that allow that informed conversation and that, you know, development of strategy and policy going forward. And certainly um, the, the model in the UK where they have the National Skills Academy for Rail has a similar skills and innovation centre and the research that they've delivered off the back of the investment in those kind of modelling tools has not only produced an income for them, which has helped obviously their, their ability to, to stay afloat as a, a virtual model, but has also influenced, you know, rail skills and wider transport strategy across the UK, because they, you know, they've, they're able to come up with, you know, data-based information that informs an approach going forward or, you know, planning for, for, for projects. So I think it's got no end in terms of those different stages of inform, influence, you know, plan, evaluate. That's that's right, Claire. Sandra, I, I no doubt you're saying this is exactly right. We need data to inform government to get their support, to get their funding. 
what are we currently missing that we need to fill the gap on? I think we have that workforce planning strategy. Like it's super impressive when you hear what they've done in the UK um, and the way that it's been used to inform, you know, business cases in future. Um, it allows governments to weigh up one infrastructure project based on um, where the employment and getting um, diversity outcomes. Like it's, you know, knowledge and good data is power. You know, I think power and, and it supports governments to make much better decisions. So, you know, I think we've spent a lot of time, we've got a, you know, a very old network, um, century old in places and it's technology could really be our friend in some of this, but at the moment we're kind of, we spend a lot of time on legacy issues at the same time we've, we've got all these digital approaches. So we're analog digital at the same time. How do we get that balance? We can't afford for, for our networks to fall over while we're planning for the, for the future. We've got to do both. Um, simultaneously, and I think that forward planning, um, you know, I th we've, we've got to do something around um, where we know at least we've done good research in recent years, um, you know, that, that original ARA report and others that have followed, including um, what's being um, launched with Claire's work, they all inform us of what's happened where we think the biggest issues are, but how do we, how we get ahead of it, knowing um, $155 billion pipeline of rail projects over the next 10 to 15 years. Um, we're seeing some work done by um, Infrastructure Australia around this, but again, it's limited to the sort of project element. And I think what we need to join up is um, something akin, perhaps smaller frame to what um, they've done in the UK with our pipeline logic, with industry, um, all on board, um, all sharing our data and intelligence of what's coming down the line. And then we can start to shape and tailor um, the the skills and training and pathway approaches. So it's all got to fit in together, but it does start with um, data. And I think governments initially were, um, but before I joined the NTC, they were saying they wanted more data, but, you know, they'd heard about the crisis, you know, people were going, the house is on fire. But, um, you know, I, and I think I think a lot of the, you know, the case, the problem case is really strong now, but now we need data to help inform how to tackle the solutions. It, it, you know, we can't do all things at once. So how do we do it in the best way possible? And I think that um, that kind of skills intelligence model is a is a helpful tool to inform the best use of government and industry fundings going forward. Mm. The consequences of inaction, or, or more importantly, the consequences of a lack of cooperative and collaborative action um, is certainly quite concerning, but we're seeing um, some wonderful stories and, and great examples that are happening in industry. Given the time, perhaps we just run around the screen in terms of final comments of, of your thoughts and, um, and uh, yeah, next steps. Um, we'll start off with you, Claire. Yeah, okay, there's just one more point actually I wanted to add as a bit of a, a, a I guess, a, a light of hope on one of the issues that's been picked up on. One of the um, aspects that the UK has moved on more recently has been development of dual professionals. So that's people that already have an industry currency that are working in the industry and are going into um, a teaching and learning environments. So whether that be RTOs, whether that be universities or whatever, now that takes real collaboration between industry and education, but that's the way we're going to get people who've got that great industry currency and knowledge, um, but able to then build their skills in terms of their educational delivery skills um, and bring those two together. So I would really encourage, you know, given one of our greatest crises is the lack of trainers and assessors that we've got and how that's going to get even greater in the future. The has, and there's probably a cost piece around here, but we won't, won't make this work if we don't have those intermediaries to deliver and assess that training and to, to work with our students going forward. So I, I really encourage looking at some of those types of models. Mm. Thanks, Claire. Fiona, um, short and sweet, last words? Oh, you're on mute. That's even shorter and sweeter. No. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. I just it's just been a great discussion and there is a lot of work to do. And I think it's we need to actually, you know, we, we're on a burning platform and we all need to work together to get off that platform as quickly as possible. Thanks, Fiona. Sandra. 
you're on mute too. <laughs> I've just taken myself <laughs> off. Sorry. Um, I've just been reading some of the comments, and you know, I, you know, it, I'm filled with optimism that some people have cracked this nut in small ways, and what we just need to do is um, put it on steroids for the nation. <laughs> and uh, I think yeah. we've got the right people around the table um, to do it because I, I'm not from a rail background. I've been working you know, for the 18 months, and they're really passionate, smart, clever people. And I think what you know, coming together is is the solution. So if we can crack that portability. No, we can find new pathways, mid-career points as well as um, young entrants. Um, I think we'll go a long way to, to, to really building a stronger and actually a national rail industry in Australia rather than eight little different ones around the place. So, Indeed. Yeah. Thanks, Sandra. Narelle? Um, I think my, my number one focus on the back of resource scarcity, and I see this day in day out, is the well-being of our people. Because with the supply and demand inequality at the moment, there's more work coming and not enough people to do the work. Our people work longer, our people work harder. So we just need to make sure that we're protecting our scarce resources in, in terms of their well-being. I will again reiterate, it's not a one size fits all. We need to make data informed um, decisions. And when we're thinking about capability building and capacity building, where does the knowledge live? Sometimes it's in a TAFE environment. Sometimes it might be in a supplier environment. How are we bringing everyone to the table to think about where's the innovation and how do we make sure that we're setting up the rail industry for success today, tomorrow, five and 10 years into the future? Good points, Narelle. Uh, Treven, final words with you. Final words, thanks, Nat. Um, I think that the, fact, the fact of the virtual national rail skills hub is going to be instrumental in, in cracking this nut, as uh, as everyone said, um, because it, it offers just lots of different uh, the the micro credentials, the diplomas, the the um, assigning um, trainers and assessors to the people that want to develop their skills in the industry. Um, and we always we on the job training uh, is essential to developing those skills. So recognition of um, all the on the job training that our our people do. Great. Thanks, yeah. Treven. And thank you all panellists. Um, this is this is great. It brings our webinar to um, an end slightly over time. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, you will all be sent a link to the report Building Australian Rail Skills for the Future in the Near Future. Um, so special thanks to um, our panellists for their contribution today and all our participants who engaged um, in Q&A online. Once again, thanks to Frauscher who sponsored the ARA webinar series. Uh, a short feedback survey will be circulated. I encourage you to complete it. Um, and if you haven't already, please sign up for all our upcoming webinars. Next week's webinar is with Sue McCary, CEO from Onza, on their current priorities, policy initiatives and projects. But on behalf of the ARA, thank you for joining us today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time.